Welcome to Ancestral Health Today, evolutionary insights into modern health. Welcome everyone to today's episode of the Ancestral Health Today podcast. And we are honored to have Mickey Trescott and Jamie Hartman here with the AAP protocol. Um, these two ladies are very popular, so many of you will probably know them. But I would love for you to um, introduce yourselves and give us uh, each a little bit of your background history. Yeah, so um, I'm Mickey Trescott, and I am a nutritional therapy practitioner, and I'm also um, a holistic functional nutritionist. And I embarked on AIP myself in about 2012, so um, now about 12 years ago, and doesn't doesn't really seem that that long ago. Back then, there was just a very theoretical basis, a few foods that perhaps some people with autoimmune disease should try eliminating to see if it improved their symptoms. I was one of those people. And at the time I had been a chef, I uh, converted my career into writing recipes for people on elimination diets like the autoimmune protocol and wrote some cookbooks. And uh, along the way, there was interest from a lot of researchers that I met at the Ancestral Health Symposium, which is always um, one of my favorite conferences that I've ever um, been a part of. And um, there have been a lot of studies now on the autoimmune protocol, and I've been fortunate to consult some of these research teams in how to um, embark on studying an elimination diet protocol like AIP. Um, And most recently, um, I have been collaborating with Angie Alt, and then now Jamie Hartman on putting together a program for healthcare practitioners called the AIP Certified Coach Practitioner Training Program. Since about 2017, we've trained about a thousand providers, and these are providers all over, natural, conventional, from health coaches to doctors, um, in how to implement the autoimmune protocol with their patients and their clients. And uh, I think that's the nutshell. And I am Jamie Hartman, and I am, uh, as he said, I am her partner with AIP Certified Coach Practitioner Training Program. I found AIP uh, around 2013, um, and I remember getting uh, in touch with Mickey and her first cookbook, which at the first, at the very beginning, was just an ebook, and being so excited because here was an entire book of recipes that I actually could eat because I was doing this new thing called AIP that was um, something I was doing in order to help, hopefully help improve my health because I have Crohn's disease. And at that point in my life, I had had multiple surgeries and had recovered from the surgeries and was trying to get kind of my life back on track and having a hard time. And so I was looking for something else that would help manage my symptoms and help me to get some semblance of having, you know, a a vibrant life. And AIP was very effective for me very quickly. I had probably been very nutrient deficient for a long period of time. So it did have quite a dramatic impact on me. And I started a blog at the time to kind of keep myself motivated to keep going. I really wanted to make sure that, you know, I had some, something that, that kept me accountable and helped me to connect with other people and gave me a little bit of a creative outlet too. At the time, I was working in the textbook publishing industry. I am a former high school English teacher. And as I was working in the corporate you know, world, there was definitely a gap in my life in terms of having that connection with people who were really you know, cared about their health and people who also supported me in my health journey. And so creating that blog and reaching out and meeting other people was truly life-changing for me. As much as the actual protocol was life-changing, that community, that connection of other people that I found when I started getting on the internet and sharing about that was really life-changing. And that led me eventually to become inspired by these folks to make a big career change and went back to school, um, became a first a nutritional therapy practitioner and then ultimately a health coach and now I'm a a board certified health coach and I have a private practice and also work with Mickey on the um, AIP certified coach practitioner training program and 
also um, try to build this community so that we can support people all over the world who are trying to use these tools to improve their own health and live with autoimmune diseases as best they can. Wonderful. Um, Mickey, can you tell us a little bit more about the history of AIP and its development, um, more on the scientific background and, um, you know, where it's been up to today? Yeah. So originally, you know, not originally, originally, there's a lot of loose threads that AIP came from. But I will say the AIP community really started with Dr. Sarah Ballantyne's book, The Paleo Approach, which really formed the theoretical framework for which foods you eliminate, the, the theory behind why they might be good for people with autoimmune disease to eliminate, and then also guidance on how long. So, you know, when I found AIP, there was a list of foods, but nobody really said, do this for 30 days, do this for 90 days. Back then, a lot of people like myself included did it for like nine months, which now we definitely don't recommend. So Sarah really put together the framework for elimination. She had a scientific basis based on other elimination diet um, research that had been done. And then also reintroduction. So what does it look to reintegrate foods and how might that process look like? And then also what might the lifestyle factors be? Because we know that it's not just about food, um, sleep, stress management, movement, and connection. Um, in about 2015, um, I was approached by a research team at Scripps uh, San Diego, Dr. Gori Conagetti. And um, my partner, Angie, and I at the time um, put helped consult her in how to research the efficacy of the autoimmune protocol for IBD. And what was really interesting about her series of studies, because there was an intervention study, there was um, a survey with IBD folks, there was a, a microbiome analysis of Crohn's disease participants that were in the original study. So there, there were three or four studies that came out of the original um, what was really cool is that it then took all of that theory that, um, and guidance that Sarah had laid the groundwork for, and then actually formally studied it with humans, which was just incredible. And from there, um, we've learned so much in actually applying that to different conditions. So now there has been a Hashimoto study. There has been an eczema and psoriasis study completed that hasn't been published yet. There's also a researcher in New Zealand um, who has studied the autoimmune protocol for rheumatoid arthritis. And with each condition, we're learning how to tweak and modify and more about timeline, more about foods that are tolerated by these different groups and communities, even though we all share this autoimmune background. Um, the way that it affects our, our bodies is going to be different, both within, you know, a disease category, but also um, all of those, you know, hyper individual reactions that that we have even within that. So, um, yeah, I hope that um, is a good description of basically, you know, it, it's amazing in 12 years that the autoimmune protocol really went from like an e evidence based theoretical protocol to now with all of these studies. And of course, we hope that there are more and larger ones, but we're really starting to drill into um, specific recommendations for specific groups, which um, is awesome because I think that those groups will be better helped, um, less trial and error, right? Um, they're they're going to have um, some more guidance there. Excellent. And how about the practitioner's uh, certification? How did that get started? So the practitioner certification came out of, uh, you know, Angie and I had at that point, 2017, we had been practicing for five or six years on our own. And we were helping as many people as we could, but we realized that the autoimmune community, the, the burden of autoimmune disease, how many people just have it and need coaching is extreme. And the autoimmune protocol, while it is not overly complicated, there are a lot of misunderstandings um, between, you know, the, especially with the public in how it is applied. For instance, some people believe that you do the elimination diet forever. That is something that, you know, even with such a large and diverse blogging community, the public still thinks that, oh, I should never eat X, Y, or Z ever again. 
Um, and so we realized that the best way to make an impact was going to be to train providers who are already qualified in whatever capacity. So it might be a fitness instructor, it might be a doctor, it might be naturopath, it might be an herbalist, um, and it might be a therapist, you know, people who understand that autoimmune disease has so many nuances in helping people heal. Um, we wanted to create something that anyone could apply to their practice and then um, be able to help people with autoimmune disease basically um, integrate that with within whatever scope they already have. So, um, you know, right off the bat, it was very successful because I think a lot of providers are aware of how powerful diet and lifestyle is and their patients and their clients really want to know what what can I do? You know, autoimmune disease is something that there is just not a lot of good treatments. It's not very understood. So patients that have autoimmune disease are uh, the rare patients that go to their doctors and say, what can I do? You know, if I could do anything, um, I would do it. And so um, the, the practitioners really fill that need in helping people um, implement these these protocols that are not overly complex, but just having someone that understands the hows and the whys and how to um, navigate some of the barriers is really powerful. And really important. Absolutely. Um, and JB, how did you come to where you are today and um, partnering with Miki uh, on the certification program? Yeah, so as I was mentioning before, my background is in education. So um, when I left teaching and then left the uh, corporate world, um, I I uh, was definitely bringing with me that experience right away in working with my um, clients, trying to be the educator as well as being their nutritional therapy practitioner and then later their health coach, but to actually help them to understand and to, to learn more about what's happening in their body and why these things are working for them. So that was something that I'd already I think, had in me to begin with. And um, I was a member of the very first cohort of, of coaches who were trained in 2017. And then the very next session that Mickey and Angie ran, they asked if I would be their like kind of assistant teacher. So um, I was more than happy to do that. So I started right away working with the groups as they came through, helping to coordinate the um, different discussion groups and the things that were happening within our community. And I really loved it. And so when Angie decided that she wanted to step down and go into a different direction and asked if I would be willing to kind of step in into her shoes and take over that half of the partnership with Mickey, I was, I was thrilled that it was able to, that we were able to work that out and bring together all those disparate pieces of my kind of story, the, the education part, the experience part, and, uh, and help, you know, to bring this program to an even greater level of educational, um, just kind of, uh, I don't know what, what really the right word is, but really having it be at that next level of being something truly about teaching the future leaders, teaching the teachers, the people who will then be bringing this into the future. I would say that if I had to kind of define my mission in everything I do in the AIP world, it's that I hope that one day I'll be very old when this happens, but that I will retire because I'm just not needed anymore. Because AIP is just part of the mainstream way of helping people who get diagnosed with an autoimmune disease to actually live well and manage their symptoms and have a better quality of life. And we don't even need to define it because it's just the common knowledge and the um, mainstream way of, of advising folks. That's what I hope happens someday. I'm sure it's going to be a while, but someday. That's great. Um, so can we go a little deeper into what the autoimmune protocol entails and uh, dispel some of the myths as well? Let's do it. Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, I'll start um, by talking about how about the elimination and then Jamie, you want to talk about reintroduction? Okay. Sounds good. So the elimination phase of autoimmune protocol is when people are removing the food. So like I said before, it's the thing that most people think 
AIP is just this piece, but actually there is a part that comes before, which is transition, and there's a part that comes after, which is reintroduction. So it's essentially three parts. So the elimination phase of what we call now, which is a new update as of 2024, um, we have two versions of the elimination phase, and that's core AIP and modified AIP. And so for anyone listening who has been familiar with the Automine program, Okay. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Mickey. Um, the reintroduction phase is truly where the magic happens because the ultimate goal of AIP is to arrive at a diet that is personalized to you as an individual that honors what you like to eat, <laughs> what you're, what is culturally relevant to you, what e in what you know what is going to make you happy because eating is a pleasurable experience or it should be and helps you to connect with your community and it should be a diet this personalized diet that you ultimately arrive at should be you know the least restrictive that you need to follow you shouldn't be restricting more than is necessary you shouldn't be avoiding foods that you don't need to avoid and you should have this freedom to um, live the life that you want within you know understanding more about what foods actually work best for you so that you can make those appropriate choices. 
and and achieve you know, all the elements of a healthy life, which is not just reducing your symptoms and you know having good blood work, but actually really thriving and enjoying your life and being part of your community and part of your family in all the ways that matter. So that's not my soapbox for why reintroductions are so important. And the the key thing to remember when clients start reintroductions is that it's not the end of anything. It's a continuation that, you know, if you do reintroductions in a really mindful and thoughtful way, your, your trajectory of healing and improving your symptoms and increasing your quality of life will continue. It's not like once you start reintroductions, that's as good as you're ever going to feel. I am absolutely a testament to that. I know a lot of my improvement in how I felt has happened after I've added foods back into my diet because many other things are at play as well. So when they, when clients or when individuals do the reintroduction process, whether they're doing it on their own or they're a client of a coach, the key thing that they're going to be doing is looking at both whether they have an immediate reaction or a short, you know, kind of near term reaction, something that happens within the first couple hours or the first day, but also looking for whether or not they have a delayed reaction to a food. And that's where working with an EIP certified coach can be really helpful because they are really well trained to help guide, you know, folks through that. But for the people that are doing it on their own, I just want to, you know, make make sure that we we've really reiterated the point that those delayed reactions, while they're not, you know, something to be afraid of, they are a very real thing that can happen. So that's why when you talk with us about, you know, why, how do you do reintroductions? I again say you need to be doing it mindfully. You need to be really focusing on one food at a time, tracking what's happening over the course of the next few days after you try that food so that you can begin to understand how that particular food that you had been avoiding may or may not work well for you as you continue through the rest of your life and start to expand your diet and bring it back in. Great. Is there anything else that people can do while doing AIP to maximize their healing, to uh, potentially reintroduce the mm-hmm. greatest number of foods um, as soon as possible? What do you advise people to to do in that interim? Yeah, so um, we always recommend that in addition to the dietary side of AIP, that people pay attention to four lifestyle areas, sleep, stress management, movement, and connection. And, you know, depending on the person, those areas can have an outsized impact on their entire journey. So, for instance, someone who is having uh, sleep disturbances and isn't sleeping through the night Sometimes they can do a lot of work on their diet, but if they don't really pay attention to the reasons why maybe they aren't sleeping, they don't um, recognize that healing as easily because their body just doesn't have that restorative time. Similarly, someone could have a extremely stressful job or something that has happened to them that they can't manage that stressor and then that is impacting them. So it's, it's important to think of everything. And one thing that is really important um, in the AIP community is just that a lot of autoimmune diseases need quality medical care. And, you know, of course, like we have a hard time accessing and affording medical care um, in the United States, at least. Um, But it is worth mentioning that sometimes a combination of caring um, with the diet and then also integrating medical care, whether that is like, for me, I have Hashimoto's, um, taking thyroid hormone. For somebody with IBD, it might actually be taking medications or using surgery um, to manage uh, or help with whatever physical situation that they're experiencing as a result of their disease. Um, And it is appropriate to combine that if that's cleared by their medical team, you know, so um, that is also something that people should consider. And, you know, a lot of people these days really don't want to be taking medications. Um, Obviously, nobody wants to have surgery if you don't have to. But the reality of autoimmune disease is that it is serious and sometimes needs a collaborative approach. So I just want to say that to encourage anyone who is listening you know, it's not a failure to have to combine. It's actually really smart because what you're using is all of the tools in the toolbox to live a healthy, vibrant life. And that's what we're after, right? Where there's no gold stars for like doing it the natural way, (laughs) like 
um, it's all about feeling good and being able to live your life the way that you want to. So, yeah, well said. Um, are there any particular autoimmune mm -hmm. conditions that you see the most success with? So with the studies, um, you know, IBD is definitely the, the results reflected in the study. Um, for those that aren't familiar, they um, did a six-week transition to the autoimmune protocol and then a four-week maintenance phase in patients with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And by week six, which is where they weren't even in the full elimination phase yet, 73% of those patients reached clinical remission, and then they all maintained it for the duration of the study. Um, and so, you know, that result, of course, that's just one study, you know, we can't um, make too many assumptions from that. But I would say that that definitely lines up with what I've seen in coaching people with IBD. Um, they tend to turn around pretty quickly. Now, Hashimoto's, and it's great. We also have a Hashimoto's study. I am a Hashimoto's patient. I work primarily with people with Hashimoto's. It's the most common autoimmune disease. Um, and I think numbers are going to start going up just because so many people struggle with hypothyroidism. They don't know that the cause is actually autoimmune, which is Hashimoto's. Um, but we do have a study with Hashimoto's. And if you read the results of the study, um, there's a lot of improvement in quality of life. That was the primary marker for the study. But, um, you know, there's not a lot of changes in the thyroid hormone. And so um, you can see the differences between, you know, like IBD is a condition that is characterized by clinical remission. Hashimoto's is, is not. You know, Hashimoto's is characterized by symptoms and symptom management. And so, you know, it's great news that people reported that they felt so much better, um, but those results can be interpreted a lot of different ways, you know. And so um, my experience with working with people with a variety of autoimmune diseases is just that there are some that, that tend to turn around quickly, like IBD. There are some that are a little more nebulous, like Hashimoto's, mostly because I think um, people with Hashimoto's have a hard time identifying even you know, what what their symptom could be caused by, if it's their lack of thyroid hormone, if it's a stress in their life, you know, there's a lot of complicating factors because there's so much overlap and those symptoms are very nonspecific. And then there are even conditions like, you know, skin conditions, like what I've learned about the skin as an organ. It's a very low priority organ of the body. It's very large. It needs a lot of nutrients. So um, I'm really excited for the eczema and psoriasis study to be published because it will be cool to be able to compare some of the data. But what I've learned just working one on one with people is that sometimes they need a lot longer um, just in the entire protocol, not just the elimination and also a lot of attention to nutrients just because of how many nutrients the skin needs. Um, so I hope I've answered that question. You know, a lot of people with really rare autoimmune conditions are very concerned that because they've never heard of somebody using AIP for their specific condition, that it might not work. And I always say, you know, you never know until you try. If, if anything, you're going to spend a month or three months eating some really good home cooked food, you're going to learn some really good skills in the kitchen. Um, and if you happen to improve, you know, your pain or your symptoms, then that's awesome. You learned something, right? Um, so I always encourage people to try it, even if it's they don't have one of those really common autoimmune conditions where there's so many stories out there. Yeah, absolutely. So as we are a global community, how do you factor in oh. cultural differences when it comes to AIP? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And one that I will be completely honest with you and say that I think we've missed the boat on for a while. Um, when when core AIP elimination was the only list that we had and we just handed that out to people and said, cut out all these foods, I don't know that that we were doing a very good job. I know we weren't doing a very good job of recognizing that we were cutting out foods that are very meaningful to many people in their culture. We were saying no grains, so you know, no corn, no rice. We were saying no legumes. We were saying eat all these very expensive and hard to find things. And there was also a lot of conversation in early days, you know, in AIP and in the whole ancestral health movement as a whole about, you know, having highest of quality in your meats and wild caught this and things that that were maybe very easy for some people to get, but not not for others, depending on where you live or what kind of resources you have. 
So that's one of the things that really drove us very seriously when we were looking at what can we find in the evidence and in our experience and in the research as well as what we know that we can do when we create modified AIP to address some of these problems so that it can be something more easily implemented by people who might not have the access to certain foods or who may be in a you know living in a place where a staple food is something that we're asking them to avoid for really not a great reason or any evidence that it must be avoided. So the inclusion of many of these foods in the modified AIP option is driven in part by that desire to have something that's more accessible to a broader range of cultures throughout the world, as well as here in the United States. And um, but that's not to say that 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 is, you know, and it is a, you know, we're not resting on that. We know there's still a lot more work to be done in terms of reaching more people and helping more people integrate these principles into their life so that they can to achieve, you know, the, the benefit and the healing that we know is possible. Great. So how would somebody who is not able to work with a coach um, because of resources be able to um, be able to determine whether they need to go to a modified AIP or core AIP? So uh, we always recommend, or actually now, I shouldn't say always, we've always recommended core AIP as a starting place for everyone. And now we recommend modified AIP um, for everyone. So actually, it doesn't have to be somebody that has a lack of resources. Um, it can be everyone. And the reason being that I, I've worked with so many people, I know Jamie's worked with so many people, and we get this reported all the time because when we surveyed our AIP certified coaches, for what they're seeing in their practices, but often um, we're modifying the autoimmune protocol before the introduction of this officially modified AIP, and we're seeing great results. So with people that come to me and, you know, for whatever reason, they can't do that core AIP protocol, I will have them include rice, maybe I'll have them include legumes, they, they will start with a pared down list of eliminations, and sometimes their symptoms resolve. And what that means is that they don't need to remove all those foods. And that's great information first, because then that person is spared all of the work and the expense and the, the frustration. You know, it's there's some social isolation and everything that comes with doing a really restricted protocol, which, you know, the cost benefit for someone who is sick, um, you know, and, and doesn't have a lot of answers, doesn't have a lot of options. Maybe they're really motivated, then they can make it happen. But a lot of people are kind of more in the middle. They they want to see um, which changes, what minimal changes are going to get them the best results. And for that reason, we recommend that people start with modified. And we're really excited about modified because um, I think it, a lot of more people are going to be able to identify some of those really big food triggers that we know are out there. Um, without all of the work of um, all of the extra eliminations. Yeah, wonderful. I know I have uh, two clients that I can remember that would not do the uh, protocol because they had to eliminate uh, rice and beans. So mm -hmm. that's just anecdotally. Uh, not sure how many people fall into that category, but it's, it's definitely an important aspect of cultural considerations that... Um, you know, also influences health, the ability to Foods. share and enjoy meals with family. Absolutely. Um, great. So what are some of the myths that you want to see uh, dispelled from what people's perceptions of AIP is? That's a that's a great question. We could probably take the next like three hours to talk about these. So I'll just go with what comes to my mind, first of all, and that is the myth that if you screw up, you have to start over. I, I hear that all the time. I see that all the time. Like somebody's like, you know, oh, I accidentally, you know, ate something that I realize now is off plan. Do I have to start over? And they're really, that's a myth. There is no starting over. I mean, yes, we do say try to do the elimination phase for 30 straight days without deviations. But what happens if you do have a deviation? Do you have to start counting over 30 days? Does your body know how to count days and there's some magical thing that happens on the 30th day? No, it does not. 
change. So that's the biggest myth I think that you know that pops into my head. Just the idea that somehow you've undone everything good that you did leading up to that because there was one slip up. So that's one that I can think of. Mickey, what's another myth you'd want to dispel? The big one that I'd like to dispel is just that avoiding foods that don't cause you an a, a reaction um, isn't prevention. So for people who, you know, they have reintroduced food successfully, they don't get a reaction, say rice. And then they say, well, it's eliminated in core AIP and I want to be a good autoimmune person and I just want to eat the core AIP because I think that's what's going to be best for me long term. That's that's not a thing. So um, dietary expansion actually is what helps people heal long term. So people should absolutely be removing foods that they know do not make them feel well or that they are sensitive to. But all the other foods, you know, if especially these really nutrient dense foods or even, you know, for for like athletes. So rice is not the most nutrient dense food, but for someone who is very athletic and burning a lot of calories and needing to replenish um, their carb stores, um, you know, rice is really important. Breastfeeding moms, people who are underweight, you know, that that is absolutely important for them, you know. So there are, you know, some arguments for just um, in those reintroducing, you know, eggs are so nutrient dense even like the nightshade family vegetables. I mean, I wish I could eat tomatoes, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, and I'm so happy for people that can because they they are so colorful. They have so many wonderful nutrients in them. And so um, there's no such thing as avoiding them just for prevention if they don't affect you. Um, we definitely encourage people um, enjoying and reintroducing those nutrient dense foods um, if they tolerate them. Um, which is a great example of why it's so important to do all three of the stages in AIP, you know, the transition, of course, to get yourself ready so you can be successful in elimination and then reintroductions. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more for people who are unfamiliar with um, AIP, what those time frames are. So you said six weeks for the preparation and then how about the elimination phase and then... Um, doing the reintroductions so the the um the six weeks of the transition phase is just a one guideline it really can be as as much time as the individual person needs um you know i've had clients who needed a little time but maybe it was more like a week a long a long weekend into a week or two i've had clients who really honestly needed like eight weeks to get ready for it to to gradually prepare. And there's a lot of ways that you can do that transition as well. I've had clients who were, you know, really focused on just trying to figure out how am I going to have like, you know, breakfast? That's the hardest thing for me. And so the first part of their transition was to challenge themselves to have a week or two of just eating AIP compliant breakfast. And then whatever happened the rest of the day was whatever happened. And then they started to think, now let me add another meal. Let me try to have lunch now. And then finally they tackled dinner. And by the time they got to doing that, they, you know, felt really ready for it. So transition can be whatever it is that you need. Um, I think you want to obviously have a time frame in mind. You don't want to just sort of be like, I'm transitioning forever and ever and ever without, you know, some date that you're planning to be fully transitioned, but it can be really suited to the individual's needs. Then in the elimination phase, our standard guidance is that you want to do the elimination phase for 30 to 90 days and you should have some improvement, some measurable improvement over your baseline. And that would indicate that you're ready to start reintroductions. If you get to 90 days and you still can't really tell that something is improving, you don't have to be symptom free, you don't have to be in quote unquote remission, but you should have some sense that it is, imp I am improving. There's something measurable, something clear to me that I can point to over my baseline. If you get to 90 days or even before then, where you, and that isn't happening, it's now time to do some troubleshooting and to figure out what else could possibly be going on. And that troubleshooting could be something they do on their, on their own as an individual looking at, you know, their lifestyle factors, looking at, you know, whether am I eating a nutrient dense version of AIP? Am I getting all my needs met that way? 
or it might be actually working with a practitioner to do some testing because maybe there's like a gut infection going on. Maybe there's something else at play that needs to be dealt with and addressed. What is some of the foods that are most difficult for clients to reintroduce? If you can each um, tell me about your experience. Yeah, I mean, gluten is always the number one for people with autoimmune disease. And it's the only one that I actually recommend that anyone with an autoimmune disease just avoid. Um, other than that, everything is fair game for reintroduction. And some of those foods are really surprising, especially to some of the people in the ancestral health community. Um, but things, you know, like rice, again, you know, have has been controversial over the years. Um, but, you know, rice can be a great addition for some people. Um, and actually, it's a food that not a lot of people are that sensitive to. I know they're out there, so don't come after me, but <laughs> it tends to be pretty tolerable. Um, tomatoes, you know, nightshades, but tomatoes specifically, um, peppers, eggplants, you know, they're, um, especially with certain autoimmune conditions, um, any type of arthritis, so like rheumatoid arthritis, connective tissue diseases, but then also conditions like Hashimoto's that have joint pain as a symptom. Nightshades um, are, are a common trigger. And then other than those two, I would say um, dairy is probably the next highest one, although there is a spectrum of tolerance that I've noticed in dairy. So, you know, a lot of people can tolerate ghee and butter and sometimes even, you know, a nice yogurt or something, maybe um, certain cheeses. But other people have trouble with all dairy or, you know, certain forms of dairy. So so there's a lot to test in the reintroductions when it comes to dairy. But I will say that it is one that a lot of people are sensitive to. Any others, Jamie? Yeah, I would just, I was going to reiterate dairy. And when we think about conditions, specific conditions, that's one that a lot of a lot of the folks that have a condition like I have that's directly impacting the gut will often have trouble with, whether it's just a lactose issue um, that they can't get past or if it's, you know, dairy overall that they're sensitive to. And there definitely has a lot of range with dairy. There's not necessarily an all or nothing kind of situation. Some people can tolerate certain forms or from certain animals, but not others. And so it's definitely one where, you know, a lot of personalized nuance and testing can really kind of help you figure that out over the long run. And then I think the other big thing is um, that whole sort of big category of the food additives, things that come into play in ultra processed foods in particular. I mean, we kind of all know those are not the best thing for anybody to be eating as a significant part of your diet, but particularly people with autoimmune diseases and particularly people with autoimmune diseases where there's some impact with their gut directly will have some trouble with things that maybe are, you know, kind of thought to be just really neutral, safe things like xanthan gum, for example can actually really be a problem for some people with, with gut issues and may not be something that they're ever able to reintroduce comfortably. Yeah, the additives also uh, with mast cell activation is a big issue, which is uh, a big part of uh, the connective tissue disorders. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big prevalent one that I see. Um, so what is the future of AIP? What do you guys have planned? Uh, for how the organization will develop, the protocol, the reach, um, what's in the future? Yeah, so I'm really excited because I think, you know, we talking about where AIP has come from, this theoretical basis to the studies that have happened now, you know, there's five or six of them. We're hoping that there is continued interest from different research teams to do some bigger studies, maybe some multi-center studies, um, get some more participants, maybe study some different conditions. That's something that I'm really personally excited about. So if anybody's listening and you're a researcher and you want to put something together, shoot me an email. Um, I would love to chat. Um, but also teaching the practitioners is really expanding the reach of the autoimmune protocol just outside of this, um, you know, like ancestral health bubble where it was kind of people in the know. Um, I think we definitely moved outside that, but now it's reaching an international audience. And so we're seeing a lot of coaches from around the world and working in different languages and with different cultures, and they're adapting the materials that we're providing them 
and into their languages and um you know their their cultural foods i love some of the foods we're always asked about we have to do a lot of research because sometimes you know we're completely unfamiliar but somebody you know in africa or central america has yeah. uh, a source of that food is very important to the people they work with and they they need the verdict you know um and so we're just so excited about that and you know every place that AIP starts to take root, it's kind of like that 10, 12 years ago, where for us, we were just so excited to find something that works. I'm noticing that energy from the coaches that that live in those parts of the world and them recognizing also the head start that they have because of all this groundwork that has been done and what started with the study. So I'm excited for a lot of that to continue. And I'm excited for a lot of these international coaches and doctors and researchers to kind of take up the torch and, um, and, you know, use the autoimmune protocol in the way that, um, you know, they, they feel led and, and hopefully give us some feedback in what they're seeing. It's very exciting. Wonderful. So how would somebody, um, become a trained, uh, AIP pr practitioner? and especially people from other parts of the world um and is there financial assistance available for people who cannot afford the certification yeah so if anybody's interested in becoming an aip certified coach they need to just go to aipcertified.com and then from there they can learn all about our program and when our upcoming dates are for when the next training will be and join the interest list from there if they're hearing this at a time when we aren't currently offering the program. And um, there, we do have right now a scholarship in place that we've been doing for the last few years now that is specifically for our BIPOC outreach. Um, so BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, People of Color. And that is something that we're very, very excited to be able to continue to offer and perhaps uh, I know there's listeners here who are now going to go and check it out. We'd be happy to talk with them further about that. Wonderful. And how about uh, people who are interested in doing the protocol themselves? What's the best way to get a hold of a coach if they have the means? And what's the best way to get started on their own if they don't? Awesome. So if you're looking for a coach, go to AIPcertified.com, the same website if you are interested in becoming a coach, because we have two, uh, two pathways. And one of them is the directory where you can search all over the world and types of practitioners, practitioners in different languages. And there are hundreds of coaches on there. They all have these beautiful new profiles and other directory that we're very proud of. You can learn so much about them, their specialties and what they can offer you. Um, if you'd like to try AIP without a coach, you don't have to have one to try it. And that's something that is very close to our hearts with, um, you know, the blogs and the website resources that we've done. Um, my website is autoimmunewellness.com and it has all of the AIP protocol instructions and food lists and recipes for free for everyone to use. And there, there's also translation. So um, in the top right hand corner, if you click the drop down, it will translate any pages. If you or someone in your, your friends, your family don't speak English, they can um, access that for free at any time. And then Jamie also runs the AIP Summit and that's at aipsummit.com. There's monthly webinars that are free for the public with AIP certified coach presenters. So you can learn about various topics. Um, and then uh, in collaboration with AIP Summit, there's also the AIP BIPOC network. And so if you get plugged into um, AIP Summit, I'll let Jamie clarify if that's correct, you will get um, access to all of those presentations from both groups. Yeah, yeah. The AIP Summit is sort of our umbrella for hosting all these live kind of things that are happening, including the, the AIP BIPOC roundtables, which are happening monthly, and then the webinars that we're doing that are monthly as well. And then once a year, we have a big annual summit, hence the, the name of it, where it's like one week of uh, you know getting everybody together and sharing all of our best practices. So it's a really great way for somebody to, maybe they've gone to autoimmunewellness.com, they've gotten their you know quick start guide and their information and some recipes, and now they want to get plugged into what are some coaches saying and doing on some of the other elements of it. 
the app he's selling is again a, a free way for them to get some extra support mm-hmm. and also a way to meet some coaches who maybe down the road they do want to work with. And so it's a great way to kind of sample the offerings as it were. Wonderful. A lot of great resources. Yes. Thank you for doing that for the community. It is um, very close to my heart that a lot of those resources are free because a lot of people, you know, uh, it's a barrier to entry for a lot of people. Um, Anything else we didn't cover that you would like to share? I think we covered it all. I I think so. Great questions, Isabel. Thank you. All right. Wonderful, ladies. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, thank you for the great work that you're doing for the community. And um, people can find you in the websites that you listed. And we'll also list them on the show notes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Ancestral Health Today. We hope you enjoyed our discussion on how evolutionary insights can inform modern health practices. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast to catch future episodes.